rugged profile, the car's the star. of this thing. Why has it got all these levers? It's an off-the-road vehicle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it is now. <laughs> How many vehicles do you know that can double up as a mobile cinema? How many that can literally do anything and go anywhere? Well, there's one, the good old Land Rover. Been there, done it, climbed it. Say hello to one of the world's most versatile vehicles. And the Land Rover has to be one of the British motor industry's biggest success stories, and it's one that's still going strong. And remember, it's a British invention designed almost 50 years ago. It's one of those vehicles that people are proud to be seen in. It's very British. You sort of feel, I can plough through anything in this. It's a beautiful vehicle. I think most military vehicles have a kind of beauty um, to them, which is a great irony since they, they do <laughs> things which are so ghastly. Um, but rugged vehicles, uh, I just find attractive. Maybe it's because I'm so unrugged myself. <laughs> Old Land Rovers are terribly British. They're made of aluminium. They don't fall to bits. You see them around the world, and, and they are just marvellous vehicles. They're far better than anything else. And once you've ridden in one, it's an unforgettable experience. My first recollection was Uncle Bert taking me and his daughter Amanda to school every morning in his... and that was a very old Land Rover. And I don't know why, but it always seemed far more exciting sitting sideways, bouncing up and down like that, going to school, than it ever would sitting in a normal saloon car. And I think, as well, the recollection that I have of that, apart from bouncing up and down, is the smell. There's a smell about a Land Rover which is unique. I started with my first Land Rover when I was 13. Father said, here's your car you're going to learn to drive in now put it together. It was a box of bits that a customer had got bored with and said, use it for spares. And Brian just said to me, well, put it together and you can learn to drive and, and use it. I don't drive cars. I don't like cars. You can't see what's coming or see where you've been. At least with a Land Rover, you can see over the hedge. Here she goes. As the sun sat on the British Empire from the suburbs of Solihull came a machine which would carry the flag of British industry to the edges of the earth. For the fearless Land Rover, no road is too rough. This was the first and finest 4x4. Land Rover came about really as a temporary measure. The idea was that the Rover company needed a vehicle that they could export, because if they didn't export, they wouldn't get ration, the rations of steel that the government was issuing to motor manufacturers. Um, they intended to uh, make this thing for four or five years and then go back to making saloon cars. But in fact, it was far more successful than they'd envisaged. And within two or three years, it was selling three times as many as the cars. They call me Mr. Lanro because I was one of the original five designers of the vehicle. We five designers started this vehicle, designed it and got it into production within 12 months. I never thought at that time that it would go on. 
of course, as soon as I'd started and found out what it could do, what we could do, I realised it was a vehicle for all time. How does it feel all these years later? Oh, it makes me feel very proud. This was the basis of all Land Land Rovers, really. A chassis constructed of bits of steel welded together because of the fact that we couldn't get enough rations of steel. The engine from the car, the dash, and on top of this, we was able to fit all the different bodies, many hundreds, in fact, that the customers required throughout the world. The production line itself was rather primitive in the early days. Uh, the chassis were cut as blank by ourselves in the guillotine shop and welded outside the main assembly sheds. The space in which you could work was minimal, about two foot square. And they used to say that if you reached about 35, you were too old to be on the track. So they gave you a line side job doing sub assemblies or helping you feed things on. I have to say that with the Land Rover, you get this feeling of invulnerability, that there is no hillside, no gully, no mountain that you cannot climb and come off better. It's a, a feeling that brings out the explorer in you. The Oxford and Cambridge Far Eastern Expedition set up a new record. 86-inch wheelbase Land Rover station wagons painted dark blue and light blue in friendly rivalry. The Jeep ceased production after the war. The Rovers brought out this, this vehicle, which I understand they didn't know at the time how successful it was going to be. And it has evolved into the most magnificent four-wheel drive cross-country vehicle ever built. Not all the bridges have stood the test of time on this unused road. You have to keep driving when you're in the water in order to prevent the water going up the exhaust pipe. And the other thing we realised was not to get water all over the electrics in, in the car. And we used to do that by disconnecting the fan belt. We met a tea planter who said, uh, do come and stay the night with us, which we were extremely glad of the invitation. And he said, oh, just follow me. The road's a bit tricky, but I expect you to manage. And we said, oh, yes, we're expert at that sort of thing. It'll be a doddle. And eventually we came to a suspension bridge which had a notice on it which said uh, only suitable for nine pack horses and had been built, I think, in 1909. And when we got to the middle and the depression of the uh, deck was so great, I thought the end had come. There was a ravine uh, several hundred feet deep below me and the road rising in front of me, and I wondered whether I'd actually get up the slope. And that ability to climb slopes has created a new cult, off-roading. Now... This section up through here looks pretty impassable. I don't know if you can get a shot of it, Baz. Should really test the beast through there. Thar she blows, Baz. Thar she blows indeed. We've got eight miles of sweat and terror through there. There's a couple of mean gullies, a bitch of a hill, and what could only be described as the mother of all ditches. <laughs> no problems for us then, eh, sir? It is sorted. It's gripped. Let's off-road. <laughs> Stand back, you look, we'll flatten you. <laughs> the Land Rover. A tough, chunky, cheeky, versatile. But those early Land Rovers weren't meant as off roaders, but earnest agricultural workhorses. The tough and tenacious American wartime Willys Jeep had caught the attention of Rover car boss Morris Wilkes. He used one on his Anglesey estate and reckoned that post-war Britain would buy a go-anywhere utility vehicle. And he was right. In just 12 months, the Land Rover was on the market. In 1947, Nancy Jones was working a remote Welsh hill farm and had heard about this revolutionary new farm vehicle. She beat a path to her dealer's door. Well, the farm was called Dalarwen, and it was a hill farm. We simply kept sheep and just a few domestic cows. But we really needed a vehicle to get all the produce up to the house, and the, there wasn't a bridge on the river. I had to go through the ford. And then I heard about the new Land River coming out. So I thought that would be rather nice. Well, I went to Land we went to the garage, and I said, I hear you've been allocated 
three three Land Rovers for the county, and I said I want one. I'm one of your customers, and I think I'm a, the most worthy cause. And they didn't argue with me; they gave it me. We had a horse called Jolly. She was a working horse, and. Um, so one day we decided we'd try and take out some farm manure with the Land Rover and she, and she washed us the whole afternoon. She wouldn't settle down to graze at all, as if she knew we were taking on her work. But the Land Rover had yet another string to its bow. Before long, the world's military had become the biggest customers. From troop carrier to amphibious vehicle to radio van, Land Rovers would be conscripted into virtually every theatre of war, bought by no less than 147 armies and police forces. The Solihull factory had stumbled into a market bigger than their wildest imaginings, a market without a single competitor. And the Land Rover's National Service helped its civilian development. Tested to destruction, made bigger, better, stronger and even more versatile. The Rover Company were obliged to make bigger vehicles to carry larger payloads. Uh, they were obliged to provide a diesel engine as an alternative to the petrol engine and in due course more powerful engines. All these factors, I think, were brought about by market forces. It was the customers demanding change and Land Rover responded to that. But some things never changed. That famous boxy shape was far too good to muck about with. Change uh, didn't happen very often. And when it did, it seemed to take a lot of people by surprise that they've they got to do something about it. In the styling department, we did a comprehensive exercise on a, uh, a vehicle that got itself known as, named as uh, 111. And it didn't really get any further than reasonably large-scale drawings and proposals uh, for the very simple reason that there was no real call for a new Land Rover. They're quite happy with the one they were producing. It wasn't as though we were sort of getting very dated. It was still selling very, very well, and that's a hard nut to crack if you want to propose something new. And there was another good reason not to change a thing. A certain celebrated couple gave the Land Rover instant social acceptability. Suddenly, the workhorse was fashionable. My Land Rover was built for the Queen Mother in 1965 with a six-cylinder Rover car engine. And it has chassis number QM1. Um, we understand that Prince Philip went to Africa and saw other vehicles with six-cylinder engines in, came back to England and said to Land Rover, I want a six-cylinder. It's got lovely deluxe front seats, which were fitted in, in fact, in 1967. Um, it's got a wireless in the front, uh, uh, an old-fashioned wireless, with speakers in the middle and at the back, so obviously the racing results could, uh, could be listened to by everybody. And it's a 10-seater version and not a 12-seater version, which is quite rare. And for that very special customer, Land Rover would go to enormous lengths to fit those little touches that mean so much. If one is fond of carrying one's pets around with one, it's surprising what one might need, like an interior rear window wiper for the condensation from the corgi's breath. Isn't that right, Clarence? From monarchs to mud pluggers, there seem no limit to the creativity of those clever people at Soli Hull. And if you're looking for the weirdest and wackiest incarnations, pay a visit to the Bashel family and the Dunsfold Land Rover Trust. Deep in leafy Surrey, Brian and his son Philip have spent a large chunk of their lives preserving some of the more unusual bits of the Land Rover story.
personal thing, we like to save pre-production or development vehicles because the main manufacturers, unfortunately, don't have a collecting policy for the prototypes or, or development vehicles. They tend to collect the first or the last of every production run, which is great, fine, but nobody seems to collect the in-between models, which is where we like to step in. Collector or not, they're addictive creatures. You don't just own a Land Rover, you become part of it. I, I don't like to see a nice vehicle rot, and I am watching it rot. Um, I won't let it completely rot. Something, you know, the last gas, I'll suddenly you know, decide to, to, to have it done. But it, it's because of our early years. I mean, there's great sentimental value um, to us because we had such fun in it. It was grey. You can, you can still see a little bit of grey on the, on, on the corner, but uh, we, we actually just bought a, a, a tin of Dulux and a couple of rushes and we painted it white. I don't know why we decided to paint it white. We should have painted it camouflage colours, really, so that it wouldn't stick out in the countryside. Um, but we decided to paint it white. <laughs> Young and foolish. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. We came over the Alps and I forgot to check the, uh, the water and the, the what do you call it, wasn't working, the temperature gauge wasn't working. And uh, we just forgot to, to, to check the water. And suddenly steam came belching out of it and uh, we ground to a halt. And uh, fortunately there was a garage nearby in a, a little French workshop. And this guy came along and looked at it and said, oh, oh il faut démonter tout ça. We have to take it all to pieces. And uh, he spent a day on it, put us back together, and off we went. That's the great thing about the Land Rover. You could always find something to do. I would say that it is one of the greatest success stories of the British manufacturing world. It's been now from 1947 until the present time, still running, still building. Just nearly as many as we ever did. It shows that it is what we thought it was. A success story without end. With sales approaching two million, Land Rovers have become a national institution. They've been imitated but never bettered, and even formed the basis for yet another Solihull legend, the sharp-suited Range Rover. So next time you see one of the scores of modern 4x4s, just pause for thought and remember that it was all started by that little green machine from Birmingham. In this job, you're apt to get a weeny bit blasé, a bit cynical about cars. But in the last 10 days, I must have driven, what, a dozen Land Rovers, all different shapes and sizes, and I've come away mightily impressed. So guess what I've just bought? Stars on Wheels next week at the same time. And Metal Detectives. One of us is a robot. Coming next. The Life and Times of Colin Corleone. Also. Cities Mad Death. Channel Zapping Junkies. Tune in to BBC Two in half an hour with the Glam Metal Detectives. Crab sticks are the Savaloy of the underwater world. Now on BBC Two, the hottest things on four wheels. In tonight's Top Gear, we test the Alfa Romeo that dares to be different. 
25 years of Ogre, the biker's cartoon, and bringing Rallycross back up to date. This is the Ford Escort, the bread and butter pudding of cars. Over the years, there have been many imitations, but basically, they're all the same. Then there's My Way by Frank Sinatra. Over the years, there have been many imitations, but basically, they're all the same. There's always someone out there, though, who can copy the original but in such a way that it's barely recognisable. This is still my way, but Sid Vicious has given us something different, something wild. And this is still a three-door hatchback, but Alfa Romeo has given us something different, something really wild. the whole car you might call it you might call it ugly like a bread van but get close and you'll find that it's a wash with stunning little pieces of design look at the bonnet the way it curls round to give that sort of captain beaky look there's the groove down the side then there's the side windows with the chunk cut out of them to give a bigger glass area and look at the back the rear windscreen wiper describes an arc, so why shouldn't the rear window? And then look at the way that they've tapered those rear lights. It is fantastic. Praise be to God, at last someone has dared to be different. Alfa Romeo, I salute you. And I hope Walter de Silva, the man who designed the 145, wins the lottery every single week for the rest of his life. You deserve it, mate. He especially deserves it because there's no price to pay for this, this wild body. <clears throat> Inside it feels light and spacious, partly because of these big windows, but also because it is big. And clever too, by scooping away the dashboard there, the passenger can sit much further forward than is usual. And that means that kids can get into and out of the back without having to tilt the seat forward. And then... There's the driving position. For once in an Italian car, you don't have to be shaped like an ape to get comfortable. Now, you might be looking at the dash and thinking, yes, I can see the engine and mobiliser and the electric windows and the airbag and the stereo and so on, but that plastic looks awfully cheap. And I'd have to agree, it does, in a £20,000 car. But this 145 costs less than £11,000. That is especially good value for money when you remember what the Alfa Romeo badge actually stands for. You might think of BMW or Ferrari as having a good pedigree, but they are strays and mongrels compared to Alfa. Enzo Ferrari began his career there, and just before and after the war, their race cars were so dominant, the drivers would pull into the pits on the last lap so the cars could be polished. Then they'd look smart as they crossed the line. And they're still at it. Last year in the British Touring Car Championship, Alpha was like Pavarotti at a Doncaster Operatic Society rehearsal. So with the 145, you get all that history, good looks, plenty of practicality and lots of equipment, all for less than £11,000. It is by far and away the best car in its class. Except for one small thing. It isn't by far and away the best car on the road. The trouble is that under the skin, it's a mishmash. It's basically a Fiat Tipo with some alphabets nailed to it. However, at least the engine is bespoke Alfa Romeo. It's the super smooth boxer unit. 
Smooth it may be, but sporty it is not. I only have 103 brake horsepower at my disposal and 0 to 60 takes over 11 seconds. It's noisy too, and there's no point going for the more expensive 1.7 litre 16 valve version, because that still isn't what you'd call fast, and it is even noisier. Now, don't get me wrong, the 145 is no worse than most hatchbacks, and you have to say, with this speed-sensitive power steering, it's actually better than a lot of them. It's just that, because it's an Alfa Romeo, because of this badge, I was expecting a bit more stuff, a bit more pizzazz, a bit more spunk. I was also disappointed to see the other day that some big Alpha 164s have been recalled because of rust. I mean, rust! It makes all their claims about bulletproof reliability for this new car a bit shallow. Couple that to average performance and too much noise, and you might imagine the 145 is destined for the same fate as Sid Vicious. But when all is said and done, the 145 is the little hatchback that I'd choose. I mean, let's face it, who needs blood and guts performance from an urban runaround that spends most of its life stuck in a traffic jam? And if you are worried about this reliability question, I have a solution. When you go to buy the car, simply say to the salesman, if it goes wrong within the next three years, can I come round to your house and burn it down? Make him put his house where his mouth is. Twenty years ago, nobody gave a stuff about cars like this. Now they're preserved for posterity and change hands for thousands. But if you're one of those old car buffs like me that got a sinking feeling when you watched all those magic motors catapult out of reach, then I've got a bit of solace for you. Let's try a bit of lateral thinking. And instead of dwelling on the classics of the 60s, what about the classics of the 80s? In the 80s, what we really saw was the estate kids of the 50s and 60s growing up. It's their chance, it's their world. Did they reject it? No, they went for it. The go-go 80s. So which are the happening classics of the go-go 80s? Well, try these three. Lancia's rally-bred Delta Integrale, Peugeot's 1.9205 GTI and Saab's mold-breaking 900 Turbo. The blown 900 pioneered turbocharging and was one of the last proper Saabs built before General Motors took control. If this isn't a classic, then I don't know what is. The 900 Turbo has an awful lot to recommend it as a classic choice because it's built to take on Sweden. They really are wonderfully put together. I had a, a 900 Turbo which had done 195,000 miles and was as fresh as a daisy. Prices of these things start at about two grand. They're not that expensive to run. They really do go on and on. So long-term ownership is a very viable proposition. And as far as driving a 900 Turbo goes, it is enormous fun. You can trickle along feeling respectable and middle-aged or plonk your foot right down to the Axminster. The turbo will cut in with a bit of lag and then whoosh, you are off. Very, very quick car, wonderful in the snow. Remember where they come from, Sweden. There is nothing that gets through the snow better than a 900 turbo. is the Peugeot 205 being held as a classic when it was made in such prodigious numbers? Well, because the term classic is all about being the best, being the, the foremost. And OK, the Golf GTI was the, the seminal hot hatch of the 80s, but of all the, the GTI pretenders, all the GTI imitators, the 205 GTI was the best.
You'd have to go all the way back to the Mini Cooper to find a car that turned in so crisply, a car that handled so wonderfully. And the 80s were all about super minis, all about tiny cars. So Peugeot took their, their class-beating 205 and they dropped this huge 1.9-litre engine. They lit the blue touch paper, they stood back and they watched. It was so quick it should have had a government health warning. It's every inch a classic. Its Pininfarina styling was admired by 80s design worshippers who holidayed in Florence and dined at Japanese sushi restaurants. Best news is hot 205 start from as little as two grand. They have loose change running costs and since good design is timeless, this is one hot hatch that won't go down the slippery slope of the XR3. But if you want some serious heave, you'd better have a Lancia Delta Integrale. The best car Lancia ever made had four-wheel drive, a turbocharger and a 0 to 60 time quicker than a Jaguar E-Type. And because this is one of the last and finest Lancias ever imported into the UK, car collectors are likely to get very hot and bothered. It trounced all the opposition in six World Rally Championships, and though this helped Lancia's reputation, it didn't do much for sales. They withdrew from the UK last year. They might all be left-hand drive, but the Integrale stands as one of the quickest ways across country next to a Scud missile. Yours for around five grand, it's handsome, race-bred Italian and devilishly quick. Perfect classic credentials. So there you go, three pieces of 80s ephemera that soon will have greatness thrust upon them. Mark my words, in ten years, maybe even five, these three cars could be gracing the front covers of classic car magazines. People might even be making television programmes about them. But a word of warning. Classic cars are not investments. By the time you've put petrol in them, taxed them, insured them, stored them, looked after them, serviced them, you will have lost money. But at least with these three, they won't shed their value like dandruff. Now, I know what you're thinking. Which one would I take home? Which one would I put in mothballs and cotton wool? Well, none of them, because I've saved the best till last, because history tells us that convertible Jaguars always become classics. Seventies heroes, Barry Sheen, Bestie, John Conti, uh, Reg Varney. Sadly, most of them are gone. Their bodies either mangled, ravaged by dolly birds, or in panto. But there is one, still living on the edge, still out there, blazing a trail on a last chance ride to Nowheresville. Ogre. He's like the ultimate biker, isn't he? He gets away with everything he tries. He's faster, bigger, best. Speed limits don't mean a thing to him. I mean, he has a go at yuppie bikers, but it's, it's yuppie bikers' attitude. He is sex on legs. Rebel, outlaw, sex on legs. Any guy who manages all that in these politically correct times deserves a bit of a tribute. And besides, he's the only guy I know who can open his beer with his thumb. Ogre really is the biker's alter ego, sort of a next door superman in a way, in that he managed to do things that uh, all bikers would like to do themselves. Yeah, he's faster than two speeding bullets. He can smash up bullying trucks with a single blow. He can take out tiresome taxi drivers. And, of course, he always gets the girl. Zap. I started when I was at college and I first bought a bike. In fact, the name Ogre fell off the end of my pen in a sketchbook one day. Um, and it was when I was reading Marvel Comics and I thought it was actually developing a, a character which would actually take the piss out of Marvel Comics. Ogre turned from a student doodle into a man with a mission. And then, in 1973, he appeared in print for the first time and struck a blow for biker power. None of the, the, the few magazines that existed um, offered me anything other than um, classified ads um, where I could buy parts. And we wanted a magazine that would pr 
present something of a, an outlaw image, a very irreverent magazine um, that was to some extent an extension of the underground press, which is where I came from, and Augury perfectly fitted into this. I've been reading Bike Magazine since, um, since it started, and the uh, first thing I always look at is Augury. Everything that has to do with biking you can find in Augury over the years, uh, all the bad stuff, the bad weather, uh, freezing cold, being cut up by car drivers, mechanical discomfort of one sort or another, mechanical disasters of one sort or another. And then you got all the good stuff as well, you know, riding off into the sunset, everything's working right. two characters, there's, there's Augury, and his friend, Malcolm, he's more like how bikers really are when they start out. Knows nothing about bikes, gets things wrong, like he'll, he'll drill, he thinks, right, I'm going to really lighten this bike up. So he gets the drill out, and he drills home, absolutely everything, even down to the bar, you know, the, um, the your levers for your, for your brake and things. Of course, he always does it too much so that... This thing looks like a piece of cheese with all these little holes in it. It looks like it's got woodworm. And of course, it comes charging to the lights, puts the brakes on, and the thing snaps off. Sadly, Malcolm, his sidekick, is really what most of us are like. He gets it wrong, time in, time out. He falls off, he gets hurt, but we'd love to be Augury, but none of us ever will be. In his cartoon world, Augury can tackle all the biker's enemies. He takes on a snarling pack of angry, biker-baiting commuters and wins. He takes on jobs with traffic cops and wins. Yep, for nearly 25 years, his brand of biker law has given every Augury fan their favourite moment. When he borrowed his uncle's outfit, an old A10, BSA A10 outfit, go down to Brown Satch, decides he's going to enter a sidecar race. There's one great frame in there where they, where they come flying around a bend, sidecar wheels up in the air here, he's leaning out of the sidecar, trying to keep it down. There's a girl leaning over the barrier, and as he passes, he just goes, hello, darling. Is he, um, is he sexist? No, no, he, he does what he wants to do, and if other people can't hack it, then it's their problem, not his. But he does put it about a bit, though. No, he doesn't. He's got a girlfriend called Mitzi. <laughs> this is Mitzi here. Oh, he books some little girl. Well, he wouldn't want to put it about with her, would he? Absolutely, yes. I mean, she's the biker's dream, you know, anybody that wears... Um, Stockings and boots like that, and a, and a basque and a figure like that is, um, it is, it's the biker's fantasy girl. I think the reason Nogri survived so long is because of um, Paul Sample's loving attention to detail. The way his drawings are full of incident in the background. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not always violent and horrible, it's, it's just interesting things and details to the bikes and all that sort of stuff. And people can identify with that, and, people, and I think that sort of thing actually grabs people far more than. You know, the storyline and the punchline, all that, all that stuff. Is he, like, known as Mr Detail in cartoon world? I don't know. Goodness Mr Moneybags, though, now that Augury has grown into a tidy marketing empire, he even stars on the next Black Sabbath album. But with his mug on a £3.50 mug, is Augury still a rebel, or should he jack it in and start thinking about a nice Metro Diesel? Augury... Could, could inspire a lot of people to the values and the attitudes of, of motorcycling as it was 20 years ago. And I, personally, I find that um, uplifting in a way. Right, that's me done, and we're off for a bit of a party now. You could come too, Augury, but shame you're a cartoon, mate. I'll borrow your hat, though. My mother used to have a beetle back in the 60s, but even though it was so orange, it made an orange look like a lemon, it still wasn't as distinctive as this special comic relief beetle, which you have a chance to win in our special Top Gear comic relief competition. All you have to do is answer this stupidly simple question. Which car did Mr Bean drive? Was it A, a Lada, B, a Volkswagen Beetle, or C, a Mini? Call on 0891 double one double four double eight. 
The winner will be selected at random from all the correct entries, and the net proceeds of all the calls will go to Comic Relief. The lines shut at midnight on 12th of March, and the winner will be announced in Top Gear on the 23rd. And don't worry if you didn't get a note of that number, because we'll be repeating it again at the end of the programme. And in the meantime, we'll try to get the damn thing started. since I last had a crack at Rallycross when I drove a Metro 6R4 just like this one here at Brands Hatch. But the glory days of the supercars are over and now they just race for fun. Barred from rallying because they simply became too fast, Group B cars like the 6R4 and Ford RS200 have now also been dropped from International Rallycross. This is the future of Rallycross. Group A cars based on family saloons like Frenchman Jean-Luc Paillet's Citroën Xantia, British favourite Will Gollop with his Peugeot 306 and Swede Per Eklund with a Subaru Impreza like the one Colin McRae used to win the RAC Rally. And of course, there are plenty of Escort Cosworths, and this one is mine. The event was the British Autoglass Grand Prix last December, and the man mad enough to lend me his car was Pat Duran. How did he rate my chances? I don't think you've got any chance, Steve, but the car's got a great chance. And with you in it, you're a quick learner, so I think you've got a great chance. Now, uh, what sort of condition do you want the car back in, though? goes without saying, I want it back in one piece, otherwise you're going to be in two pieces. Well, I managed about 10 lap practice in this brand new car yesterday, but this is race day. I better practice a start. Now hold it, 7,000 rev. Oh! The Brands Hatch Rallycross course is half tarmac, half mud, and try to control 600 horsepower as you round paddock and dive down, tumble down hill, through the chicane and back onto a racetrack that's smeared with mud is a delicate art. While I struggled to learn the knack of getting the best out of the Ford in the limited time available, Ford's Rallycross superstar, Martin Shanker, tried to convince me that it was, at least, an easier proposition than the old rear-engined RS200. I think the car is, is, is more stable to drive. It is, it's got the engine in the front, so it's the sort of hammer, throw the hammer away, and the head will always be in front. So, they are a bit more uh, easy to drive. But when it came to his quarter-final, Shanker found life none too easy, as he was headed by European champion Kenneth Hansen's Citroen ZX and Britain's Barry Squibb in another escort. But Shanker is a man who will try anything to get past. <laughs> Even if it doesn't always work. While Squid continued unperturbed to claim second spot, Hansen's only problem en route to victory was very limited visibility. But why was a Swede in a French car? <laughs> I, I was uh, four years in the Group A two-wheel drive championship with Ford, but uh, I didn't get any directly good support, so I went to Citroën, and uh, we had a very good support there, and uh, I'm uh, not regretting that because the car is working very well. My quarter-final put me up against Per Eklund Subaru and British favourite Will Gollop in his fast-starting Peugeot. But even the best make mistakes. Gollop went wide. Oh, Gollop's all over the place. I can't believe I'm following Will Gollop. Oh, now I can as they go away from me. As Teal Hansen belted me up the backside, Per Eklund belted the barrier and Gollop disappeared to victory, leaving me to escape the close attention of Hansen and finish a contented second. But despite winning, surely Will would prefer to be in his old Group B Metro. I'd rather be driving this Peugeot, because honestly, it handles better, 
It's it's not got the low down grunt that the, the Metro had, but it's it's getting there. We've got a few more bits to do to it for next year. Well, it's a bit complicated this rally course. Although I finished second in my quarter final, the fact that I was only 11th fastest overall in qualifying has meant I'm on sixth spot in this semi behind the guy I beat in the quarter. But uh, I reckon I'll beat him again. You'll see me in the final. Transmission.